So this is me eating and drinking my way across the planet with my borrowed uh, nephew, uh, just, and then my handsome husband. So um, I am a San Franciscan. I'm actually born and raised in Malaysia, and, um, but I'm a San Franciscan at heart now. Um, and so a lot of people ask me when I joined Taco Bell, what's a um, UC Berkeley left wing People's Republic of San Francisco foodie doing at, uh, now in Orange County uh, for a QSR brand? And uh, it, you know, it took me a little while to actually make that leap. And, and, and I'll tell you a little bit about um, really what drove me to come to Taco Bell um, after doing a lot of research about the company. And you know, one of the things that I, I'm, I'm really very passionate about is food. And uh, that's me sort of barbecuing my satay in the backyard when I lived in Florida. Um, and I, I started to realize just in my conversations with Taco Bell that you know, the average American spends $20 a day on food. And you know, obviously, when I worked at Starbucks, I mean, I, I, I can get out, I can walk away out of Starbucks spending 20 bucks, and I haven't even bought lunch. You know, so um, 20 dollars a day on food, and 10 dollars of that is groceries. And for those of you who are restaurateurs in the in the uh, room, um, which I think most of you are, you know that the you know with Amazon's stepping into the grocery arena and with delivery and fresh choice, I mean, hello fresh and all of that, you know, you start to realize that between groceries and fast food, that's really how America eats. And so if I really have an importance in food, if I, if I look at food as a very important component of my life and I want to, um, you know, change the way America uh, relates to their dining out experience, then Taco Bell is the perfect place for me. So that's how I, I, I made the journey in my head to accept the job, and I've never looked back, and I have been enjoying my time there since. But so here's the reality of the pressures, right, that we are all faced. Um, I just talked about the, the consumer perception of food um, and the competitive landscape of brands, and then consumer standards. I mean, we talk a lot about millennials. Um, we, you know, they want what they want, when they want, um, and how they want it. Um, they, it, you know, so the idea of fast food isn't just a fast food phenomena anymore. Everybody needs it faster and faster these days, um, with uh, elevated expectations around quality and speed. Um, and of course, technology has just hyper warped even people's idea of what is fast anymore. And then there's food television and home garden television. Um, I will confess that is my guilty pleasure when I'm actually um, at home, if I'm, if I'm doing anything, usually one of those two channels are, are on. So now all of a sudden, even people who are not in the design business are, are design experts, you know? Everything from you know, Chip and Jojo and their ship lap to open kitchens. Um, and uh, uh, of course, food television, everybody all of a sudden understands how all the food is you know, prepared and everybody wants to, all the high-end restaurants are now you know, turning their restaurants inside out and people are just have hypersensitive to actually how their food is prepared and what they're eating. And so that has definitely changed the way that um, us as restaurant brands um, present ourselves and how, what we need to be aware about with our customers. So, so that's the macro landscape. And then um, for Taco Bell, what does that mean to us? So when we're actually talking about how to actually translate our brand to um, the three-dimensional space, for us, we had to do a deep exploration around how we started in the beginning and actually who we are because we, you know, authenticity is actually very important and actually the face that you show to the customer. So everybody knows we, um, we started with Glen Bell in the 60s. The very first restaurant um, was the Numero Uno, which you see a darling picture of here. We actually recently just picked it up from Downey, California, also the starting place for McDonald's. I don't know what was happening in Downey, California in the 60s, where McDonald's was born and Glen Bell um, started uh, Taco Bell. But uh, this little restaurant was uh, due for the demolition ball, and uh, we actually picked it up and moved it, and now it's sitting in our parking lot in. Uh, in Irvine while I, we contemplate what fun home we're gonna reinvent it as. 
So hopefully next time I come back, I'll be able to tell you a great story about that. But the first one, when Glen Bell opened, um, you know, he really wanted it to feel very sort of authentic Mexican. Uh, it was a walk up um, on weekends. He would have mariachi bands playing in the parking lot and there would be live chickens running around. How that says authentically Mexico, I don't know, but um, uh, maybe we'll bring the live chickens back someday. But anyway, it was just this whole entire theater around presenting the brand in this very sort of um, um, very you know irreverent way, and um, that irreverence continues um, to you know to this day. Um, bringing the taco truck to Alaska was a request that one of the, our fans made, and so because we didn't have a, a, a Taco Bell there, so we actually flew the truck and drove it around. I think it was Anchorage for a while, and then of course the infamous Doritos Locos tacos. I personally eat the fiery ones every other day or so. I actually eat Taco Bell. Um, pretty much every day. So um, don't let it fool you. It, it, won't, it doesn't necessarily add 15 pounds, as I think I'm evidence of that. Um, and then there's, that's the stuff that we do as a brand. And then there's a whole bunch of stuff that the fans do um, that actually rounds out this picture of who we are. So um, these are just some images of what other people tweet or what they've um, you know, communicated about their love for the brand or um, wedding dresses that they've made out of Taco Bell wrappers, um, or soap that has little Taco Bell icons in it, or a sports bra, of course. Who wouldn't want a Taco Bell sports bra? So these are all generated not by us, but just the fanatics out there. And uh, you know, you, you, can't, you can't invent these things. Um, these are all true stories. And uh, you know, then there's all the celebrities from uh, Fergie and her uh, glamorous life uh, album. And I mean, if you guys want to go on your phones, I'm happy. You know, hashtag Fergie, uh, Taco Bell, or um, Anna Kendrick, who has this absolutely hilarious session on Conan O'Brien where she just confesses for about 15 minutes how she's obsessed with Taco Bell. Um, you know, obviously. Um, President Obama talking about the Stila base, trying to get uh, people to go out and vote. Um, and then after they, they vote, go and treat themselves to the free Taco Bell um, after uh, the Cleveland Indians um, stole a base in the, in the World Series. So, you know, it has a life of its own. The brand, it just is very rich in, in culture. And, you know, it, it just this, this irreverent storytelling that actually goes through and, and which is bigger than the, than the brand itself, which I think is a magical, magical thing. So, and then obviously the press adds to that as well. So what do we do with that? You know, since the brand is really defining itself, whether we want to or not, um, in culture, in, um, in some of the, uh, the things that we do, but even more importantly, in, the, in people's reactions to the brand. And so how do we, how do I, as someone who is meant to bring it to life from a three-dimensional space, make this all make some sort of sense in this sort of magical hodgepodge that it is? So really, the way that we define it today is it's not a restaurant brand, it's not a fast food brand, it's a QSR. It's basically bringing something together that's the social experience of food. Um, it's more than just coming in and eating, it's more than just the drive through. So how do we actually bring that to life when I'm starting with this? Um, so you see numero uno in the corner, and then this is just our evolution through the last 30, 40 years. And we really, before, um, before the couple years ago, we did the traditional uh, make every store look the same. And that is the comfort that people have with familiarity. If they know, if they see, you know, it's, it's, it's probably the, the golden arches, right? If you see the golden arches, you know there's a McDonald's. For us, if you see um, the bell and the arches, you know it's uh, a Taco Bell. And so even in the evolution, we continue to bring that arch um, so you'll see um, in one of the pictures, there's actually sort of a flying arch, which was an allusion to um, the original mission uh, style. And then on the inside, we've got all these sort of references to the mission style. And that was how we defined um, Taco Bell as icon, which of course we know is, is not true, right? Even if you try to make all the restaurants look the same, the reality of it is between the cities, between the communities, between the sizes, between the buildings that you take over, they're going to take on a life of its own. 
and we are more complex than a building that looks the same everywhere. Um, that we are more, um, the, the brand as a, a personality is, is more complex than that. It means many things to different people. And so we just threw that out a couple of years ago and we said, let's just start over, strip it all the way back down to its basics, and then start redefining again the, the styles that, that are inherently us. And so we came up um, uh, with that same idea for the logo. Um, the logo originally, uh, well, when I started was, I bet most of you cannot tell me what the color of our logo was two years ago. Um, how many people th think it was pink? Raise your hands. There's one, two. How many people think it was yellow? How many people think it was orange? Lots of hands. Um, how many people think it was purple? Okay, so the majority. Actually, it was pink, purple, and yellow. But many people think it's orange. Um, but so you think you've got this iconic logo, and um, the reality of it is we had so much color going on all through the building that it really wasn't iconic at all, even though the bell itself is iconic. And so we realized, like a lot of other sophisticated brands, like a Nike or an Apple, it's really not about the particular color. It's about the bell. It's about the shape. And once we freed ourselves of being pink and purple and yellow, we started to realize that we could be all colors, not just those three colors. And then all of a sudden, it started to take on this life of its own to become this really iconic shape, and we feel that it stands on its own. And so now, when you see the Taco Bell logo manifested in ads or in uh, artwork or in uniforms, et cetera, it no longer tries to use the Taco Bell purple. Or, you know, uh, the, it just, it just uh, uh, takes on a whole bunch of different life of its own. And so we did the same thing to the buildings. And we're starting off at least, I don't know how this is going to work, we'll start off with these four. Um, and each of these are supposed to represent an element of our journey of where we are as a brand. Um, and you know, we'll see if it sticks, if these are the four that live on, or if three out of the four tend to be more popular, and we, need, we find that we have something missing, we'll probably add a couple. But it's kind of a journey, and we don't feel that it uh, limits us to uh, you know, the 2018 version. It really is meant to just sort of take on a life of its own. So Modern Explorer is kind of, um, you know, sort of a nod to the fact that we've always been a, a brand of exploration. So this um, design or style, for lack of a better term, is meant to be an exploration of materials, um, an exploration of styles. It's kind of modern, and it's um, and and you just sort of layer on, you know, whether it's the rust or the uh, the reclaimed wood, or just it really just about a material study. And then. Um, this is kind of the actual test store that we built. This is sort of what it turned out to be, which we're really happy with. And then the next one is Heritage. This is the one that's probably the one that is most familiar to the people who are who go all the way back to the original mission style with us. This is the mission style grown up. And so I described to you what Glenn Bell had as um, our little sort of mini Tijuana in a parking lot. So the way I described this one is it's still that Spanish, Mexican-inspired flavor, but it's probably a little more grown up, a little more Santa Barbara, a little less Tijuana. Um, and so, um, but still it obviously has that very Latin flair um, with the, uh, the tiles and, and the lighting, et cetera. And uh, it still feels very much authentically us. And you know, the third one is a nod to the fact that we are not a Mexican brand. We're a California brand. In fact, we're a, a Southern California brand. And a lot of the people who embrace our brand internationally, they are uh, engaged with the fact that it, it's a Southern California brand. So this is kind of that mid-century modern celebrating a fresco dining. It's much, much bigger on the outside than on the interior. And uh, we are, I think we have three that we're building this year to see how this one plays and, and whether or not the customers take to it. And then the last one really celebrates our foray into the urban environment. So we've grown up like so many other fast food brands in the suburbs of, um, of you know, cities everywhere. And this year, last year and this year, we've had a much, much more concerted effort with doing more urban um, restaurants. And so this is very new to us. 
and how to actually manifest that into a design that is respectful of um, a historical building or uh, industrial building is a little bit um, of an adjustment from, from, a, from a brand perspective, but we are, we're having a lot of fun experimenting with it. But it's all about storytelling, because what we're trying to do is build a person. So the people who actually, um, or introduce ourselves as a person to our customer. The brands that really survive, as you guys know, is, are the brands that customers relate to as a friend, the ones that they invite home again and again. It's, and um, in, in once you cross over that threshold from being transactional to being a trusted brand that is a friend, then you really um, have Sur, you know, you can survive a whole bunch of missteps if you actually uh, continue to innovate and, ex and experiment. Um, you, um, customers actually give you the license to try things and are pulling for you. And so, you know, that's the one thing that I think for us we've been able to do through the years is actually sustain that brand love and how we actually go about it from a from a, um, a store design perspective. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to uh, translate as well. So part of that storytelling is being very overt about what, the, what some of the things that we're testing in the store. So in this particular case, it's a solar powered canopy. Um, and then you know when we do use reclaimed wood, it really is reclaimed. It doesn't come from the distressing factory of, of new wood made to look reclaimed. So we like to tell the story of where we got it from. And so all of these layers and complexities and storytelling that we're doing from a design perspective obviously is a total nightmare to my construction team. Because you know, now we've gone from furniture packages that have 30 SKUs to 127, and then there's four building types with all these layers of materials that continue to evolve. And so um, really, the way to simplify this and make this execute easy to execute from a development team perspective is we stripped back anything that was extraneous that didn't have a function from a um, operational perspective or didn't story tell about the brand. And so we really brought it back to a kit of parts. And um, I think perhaps the way to illustrate how we're putting the building back together after stripping it back so that we can actually translate these different looks without too much complexity, um, I, think we'll, uh, I think this little video can show you a little bit more what that looks like. Um, so I struggled a little bit about, you know, talking about brand reinvention, and then obviously trying to get into some of the actual, you know, hardcore elements of what it actually what are the pieces that we've been developing um, with the redesign work um, from a development perspective. And so I'm going to touch on this a little bit. I'm not going to, uh, and you know, I'll, I'll save a little bit of time for Q and A in the in the back uh, end if you want to actually ask me about each one of these elements. But you know, essentially, I th I thought that. Um, instead of just talking about brand reinvention, there are some practical aspects of how you actually bring this to life as well, which we're still struggling through. And so if I were to gauge where we are in the evolution of this um, transformation, I would say we're kind of a little bit beyond Caterpillar, you know? Um, so there's still some kind of um, um, uh, experimenting that's happening out there, um, but 
is, you know, to get to this point, a lot of it was about stripping back, getting rid of stuff, really evaluating, um, taking out, we took out like 17% of the walls, um, half the lights, uh, we made the building tighter, you know, and, and shorter, um, and just more compact so that we can layer back on the pieces that we felt were more enriching. Um, and so there is a lot of that heavy lifting that's also gone on, aside from just the soul searching of what it is that we, what is the face that we're trying to uh, show the customer and, uh, and how did we want to come to market. Um, and so part of the elements that, we, that we've introduced is um, a new furniture package. And so when I talked about going to 127 SKUs, the reason for that is we don't want to have to re reinvent ourselves um, every, sing every few years, even though that is the pace of change that's happening these days. And so really the way we look at it is a, a, a kit of parts where we would come up with structure and cladding so that we could be opportunistic, whether it's you know, finding a lovely you know, um, a batch of wood from um, a, a bunch of old boats that are being decommissioned that we want to use for community tables, but you can just make a small run of, or some, um, you know, whether it's fabric for upholstery that you can do a small run, but really to take advantage of the mass production, looking at things in terms of structure and cladding to allow you to be able to move through change over the next five, 10 years in a much more simpler way. In the past, what we would have done is in a new design, we would, thrown out, we would have thrown out all the old and started new. So hopefully this actually can help us along the evolution. Um, and so how, as part of that furniture package, it's also creating obviously different types of seating, not just the two tops, the four tops, and the community tables, but really you know, the lounges, the exterior, um, and all sort of being able to evolve very easily out of the, a, a very simple piece, um, parts and pieces. So you know, IKEA does this best, right? Every year they have the kind of the new catalog that lands on your, on your uh, doorstep and you look in and you're like, okay, there's you know, 10 new colors of this particular couch and um, at the end of the day, if you have the misfortune of actually putting one of these pieces together, it's still that same hinge and it's still that same little part. I don't know how many pieces they can make with that hinge and that part, but somehow they manage to year after year. The car companies have also gotten very good at this um, because you can customize your car, but at the end of the day, it's mass customization. You just pick your colors and you pick this and that and the other thing, and now it's uniquely you, yours, but really what it is is um, they've, they're actually designing cars as kit of parts these days. So we've taken that same approach and it's enabled us to actually create much, a lot of different looks with a, a few um, simple elements. Um, obviously, we're doing the open kitchen too. Um, th that is kind of the, way, uh, the wave of the future and we believe in it and, and our customers are certainly enjoying it and the ones that we've executed to date. Um, and then beverage presentation, which is a very new thing for us. Um, this is a shot from our Vegas store um, where we're actually serving twisted freezes and beer and we're doing a smaller version of that in our cantinas. We've also started to introduce retail. These are not things that you would do in every single store. We've been very opportunistic to place them in particular ones. Once again, fleshing out that whole idea of being more of a lifestyle brand. And then signage, you know, not being so stuck in, on, on a, a handful of different sign executions, but really having some fun with it. That is one thing that appears on every building, and so we look at that as an opportunity to be lighthearted and sculptural and, and take advantage of whatever the building elements are that are there that allow us to actually um, express ourselves. Um, and then murals, I, I mean, you know, whether it is actually custom murals that we're engaging with different artists to introduce into the restaurant. This one I love, actually it's the wrong scale. You're really meant to stand here and have your picture taken with or without your significant other. Um, and so just really trying to find ways for uh, the customer to actually relate to some of the pieces that we're actually introducing in the restaurant. Interior graphics as well. And uh, obviously, technology and, and digital interface. Now, um, we're a little late to the party on the digital menu board, so we just started rolling those out last, um, last year. But that's kind of the price of entry these days. Most of the newer brands, they, they come right out of the gate with this. We've started introducing kiosks into our restaurants, um, mobile apps, um, televisions, you name it. Um, technology is how people speak to one another these days. And so you're going to be seeing more and more of that in our restaurants as well. 
Um, and then, you know, obviously it, it's much more freeing when you're going into an urban environment where you don't have to actually have stamp out the same storefront in every single um, environment anymore to be able to take advantage of what the building gives you in order to translate how you actually engage with the customer. And so, um, and the other piece to an urban, going into an urban environment as well is actually introducing the idea of a very, very, very tiny building, potentially without a, a dining room, just as a walk up. And we've been having fun playing with a couple of the containers. Um, we're exploring whether or not that's viable for us. I know a lot of people have stopped and started in this, um, in this arena. We'll see how our journey goes. We did have uh, one experiment with um, a restaurant that we opened originally at South by Southwest. It was just a pop-up. Um, and after we took the restaurant down at South by Southwest, it was a fully functioning restaurant. We actually, one of our franchisees decided to buy it from us and they opened it at Southgate. And so, um, which is a great story on its own, South by Southwest to Southgate, California. And uh, we, we're gonna probably build on that, on that success and see, and see where that takes us. Um, so, I, I, I forgot to mention that when in the technology arena, one of the things that we do in our restaurants is that we actually have our own channel um, with Mood Media called Feed the Beat. And this is something that we've been doing for years. We actually um, sponsor um, struggling artists, struggling musicians that tour across the United States, sometimes in the form of uh, um, gift cards so they can stop at a Taco Bell and, and eat while they're on tour, or sometimes it's actually a check that we cut them. And some of these musicians have gone on to bigger and better things and have stayed in the Feed the Beat um, family. And so we're looking to try to integrate them into the restaurants more than just playing the music. Um, we're looking for that as an opportunity to also enrich the experience. And then similarly, we have the Live Moss Scholarship Foundation, which we actually, um, if you've seen any of the ads on TV, we actually, uh, unlike a lot of scholarships, we don't fund athletes or academics. We fund what we call the other ones. So these are passion-based um, scholarships where people submit their stories and we essentially give them scholarships for uh, for communicating the passion for whatever they, that is that they're doing, whether or not it's um, you know being, becoming a ballerina or um, graffiti artist or you know it could be basket weaving, it could be anything, but it doesn't. It has nothing to do with academics or um, or um, athletics, which is the more more common scholarships in you know, it, that's out there. And so we've started to actually form a relationship with these kids, and so now we're looking to try to see whether or not we can integrate them into the building design and into our brand in an even more meaningful way. And so um, how many of you have been hearing about Taco Bell Cantina? Hopefully, uh, maybe half of you. So the biggest buzz over the last couple of years, aside from just the brand reinvention, is that Taco Bell has started to introduce the idea of cantina, which means that we have serve beer and alcohol um, in some of our restaurants. Who knew that Mexican food and beer go so well together? Um, and so, and you know, we know that we're a little bit famous for um, for actually. Uh, people going out late at night and then coming to Taco Bell to have um, a drink, I mean, um, to have food. And so we said, well, you don't have to go somewhere else. Now you can come to us and then you can have that, that uh, craving at 1.30 in the morning without having, having to go anywhere. And so uh, our Newport store, we actually even introduced our own custom beer. Uh, when we opened, there was a line out the door waiting for us to open, not for our food, unfortunately, but it was for Beach Bell the, that you can only get at our Newport restaurant. So that went over so well that we're looking at that as an opportunity to do that in other places. Um, 
the, you know, the first ones that we did were in San Francisco, as well as in Chicago. Wicker Park was the, the very, very first one that we actually opened. And then, of course, we came right out of the gate and um, decided that we were going to test it in the mother of all cantina locations, which is on the Strip, across the street from the Cosmopolitan in Vegas. So I know most of you, a lot of you go to conferences there, so you'll have to check it out. It's open 24 hours. Um, it's very, very busy at 3 and 4 in the morning. That's probably our busiest times. Um, and a lot of the elements that, we try, that we're rolling out in the rest of the cantinas across the country, we actually tested um, in Vegas. And so here's a little snapshot of some of the cantinas that we have been opening across the country. And so the story continues with all the, uh, the rest of the cultural topspin that we've been getting, aside from just the design of the restaurants. We had a test kitchen reservation, um, an open table where we invited a bunch of people to come to our, um, our offices in Irvine to um, test what crazy concoctions we come up with. It was the fastest selling reservation in the history of open table. We've done it twice now. Um, we had our first weddings at because why would you have a restaurant in Vegas without actually having a chapel? There's always someone ordained on staff, and I think it costs a few hundred dollars to uh, feed 25 people and get married there. And of course, steal a game, steal a taco, our relationship with the NBA Finals. Um, and we just recently announced our relationship with Grubhub. Um, we uh, retail with Forever 21. And with Lyft, we went into taco mode this year. So we're just continuing to test and innovate fast and furious. We've always been known as an innovative brand from a food perspective. We're just starting to carry that all the way through from a design perspective, um, as well as continue to push the envelope on um, really reintroducing the brand as a lifestyle brand versus just a, um, a fast food restaurant. And so I will leave you with uh, uh, one last video, which hopefully inspires you to go to our Vegas store, and then I will open it up for questions. Thank you. <laughs> I guess that was anti no, I didn't know I saw the slide come up. I didn't know if you were going to talk about something else here. I guess that was anticlimactic, huh? Like no, I think the slide threw everyone off. I thought they were going to go something else. Oh, well, I just thought this was actually, I mean, I know that you guys have been talking about brand reinvention, a lot of the topics today. And I thought that this was a, a, a great, well, it was a great quote because it actually mentions Taco Bell. But it really, more importantly, um, you know, really reinforces what we've been talking about, where it's not just about the peddling of a single identity. It's more complex than that. And brands, people want to be, relate to your brand in a more um, authentic and holistic way versus just you sell tacos or you, you sell shoes or you sell you know, whatever it is that you sell. That pu they want to move from a transactional to an actual uh, engaging of a relationship with you. So I just thought this was a, a, a good clip. So. But uh, I will open it up for questions if anybody has any. I know for you East Coasters, yeah. I'm not just keeping you from, from lunch, I'm like keeping you from cocktails. Yeah, we got, we got a question out here. So, hi. Hi. Um, obviously, you've upped your game from an interior look. Um, how, how are you keeping the economics? Like, how does it work with your 
ROI? Yeah, so uh, I think um, buried between the lines of me saying that we stripped everything extra, you know, down in our buildings, uh, really we, we sort of took a good hard look at anything that was not um, absolutely necessary from an operational perspective or actually was um, engaging to the customer um, and we, we, took, we got rid of it, right? So we, we removed a, a lot of things like extraneous walls and, or decorative elements on the building that we felt were not um, uh, necessary. So it, you know, it's, the, it's the, you know, the, I don't know, it's the condoization of it, I guess, it's, you know, where you really say, do we love it? Does the customer love it? Do we need it? And if it didn't answer those two questions, we got rid of it. So the stripping down was the first exercise. And then we started layering the richness back in with, with storytelling. So, um, and so far it's, it's, it's proven out to, to work out for us. Any other questions? I guess I have a question because you touched on one of the, the final slides there um, about delivery and your partnership, I think it was with Grubhub. Mm -hmm. What's the, you know, we, we talked about this last night, Nolan Bushnell did too, uh, you know, about the future of delivery. What's any, anything that you guys are working on to take it on yourself or there's more of the partnerships? Um, you know, uh, so we've been operating off of this umbre uh, umbrella of all access, you know, so the, the one thing that the, obviously we know that the customers, they, they want what they want, when they want it, how they want it, right? Mm -hmm. So they want to, they still want the drive-through, they still want to go into the restaurant, they still, um, you know, well, they want to order on their phones, but not, not everybody wants to download the app, so we still feel that there's a future in kiosks. And then delivery is just another element of that whole idea of providing all access to the customer. Um, you know, to do it really well, uh, I think for us, we did look at potentially doing it for um, doing it internally just as yum, but the reality of it is there's a lot of people who are further along in this game than we would be starting from scratch and we are working more on our core competency which is basically the restaurants and the food and all of that and so we felt that the partnership with Grubhub was, was the way to go after doing a lot of experimenting with different people, talking to a lot of people, talking to you know, um, DoorDash and a lot of other companies as well. Uh, so it was, it was definitely probably over a year and a half in the making and we decided to, to pull the trigger just recently with Grubhub. So we'll see how that goes. We're optimistic anyway. We have a question down here. Um, what has the response been from the uh, artist community now that you've liberated your logo to be uh, altered, if you will? Because even the image behind you kind of feels this pop art kind of mm -hmm. interpretation, and I'm thinking of like Andy Warhol and the Cam uh, Campbell soup. Are you inviting artists to just express themselves with the logo? Yeah, actually that's a great um, observation. We, we, it's funny because we give the logo to artists when, when they're creating something unique from us, uh, for us. Um, whether it's a, low, um, a piece for uh, an, an ad or if it's a piece for a mural. And they've been having so much fun with it because people are usually very precious about their logo, right? Don't do this or don't distress it or don't melt it or don't, you know, there's usually a lot of rules whereas we, we don't have those. Um, and so um, it's, it's interesting because it's actually been harder to, to tell them not to just give us a bunch of pieces with just the logo, because we want something more than that. So the example that I showed you with the Newport um, store, the artist that we chose to do the mural, it's, it's actually is on the outside and it runs through the whole inside of the actual restaurant. Um, he's a, a local artist in Newport, and he does a lot of work with um, board shorts and surfboards, etc. And the first few pieces that he came up with all had to do with the logo. And we said, well, you know, we kind of also would like you and Newport in the in the work. And so he did kind of marry the two, and then ended up with with a happy medium. But yeah, I mean, people have been really enjoying it, and we've been talk, toying around the idea with, you know, do we crowdsource a bunch of work? And it's it's been really fun and very liberating. And internally, I mean, everybody just you know in our art department just lost their minds when we decided that we were just going to go down this path. Um, and we, you know, absolutely very very quickly after we decided to do that, that it validated that it was the right thing to do. And people haven't actually you know, they still know it's Taco Bell. Oh, how that plays internationally, we've been a little bit slower because obviously people, we're not as well known internationally. So we've been much more, a little more static, at least out of the gate. Um, but in the US, you know, where we're, 
you know, six, seven thousand strong. I think the the bell stands for itself. So slowly but surely, I've been trying to see if we could get brave enough to just drop the words and just go with just the logo. But we'll see. Yeah. Well, Any excellent. other questions? Fortunately, we're out of time. But thank you so much. Again All right. For joining thank us. you so much.